Okay, let's talk about the circus. Want to? Yeah. Okay. So I will ask everybody to please hold any concerns or comments until I'm done because I'm very passionate about this topic and if I get off topic, I'll never get back. Okay? So if you could just um, help me out with that. So that's really, I, I shortened my job title, okay? But I truly did run away um, from my senior year of college and join Ringling Brothers Barn and Bailey Circus. I actually went to Clown College to embellish what I thought was going to be a career working with kids who hated school. I thought clown skills would really kind of fill the gap. There was a huge gap, still is. Um, I had no intention of joining the circus, but I did. So, <laughs> and I found out that um, I kind of was destined to be a clown. But in that process, I found out um, about the amazing animal care that the circus entails. It is unbelievable. And that is ultimately what I ended up doing as my career. I'm so grateful to be back with them in a capacity that involves educating young people to learn entry-level skills that will en enable them to take care of elephants. Um, we had no training. We just learned in the apprentice fashion. And uh, that's, that's no longer acceptable. So that's one of the improvements that I want to mention. Um, this is basically a family album, and the quality of some of these pictures is really not that good because this is obviously pre-digital. Um, I'm from the Clown College class of 72, which really dates me. I have a 40-year involvement with this passion that has increased by the year. So I begged and begged to get in the Elephant Act. The, a woman clown was pretty much an oddity. I was the fifth woman clown that Ringling Brothers hired. So I had to convince them that I really uh, could, and could ride an elephant. It was much more difficult than I thought until I got used to it. I thought from having ridden horses that you just get up there. But you get up there and you're on the end of the earth and there's no neck, no reins. <laughs> and, and I really loved this. I learned right away, if you're a rider, you do not talk to the elephants. In the circus, the elephants are so revered. And to be a handler is a very, very uh, big accomplishment. They handle the elephants. You just get up there and get off and go on to your next thing. And I kind of like that because this, to this day, we treat elephants like elephants. And uh, to me, that shows a great respect for their dignity. Um, amazing thing to be two times, three times a day. That's the, our usual show schedule is two shows a day, three shows a day. The highlight for me was obviously riding the elephants. And back then, I did a lot of interviews because I was a, cl a college kid. You know, So Ringling Brothers exploited that. What's a college kid doing in the circus? They were all warm, fuzzy interviews, and I loved doing it because I loved talking, and I loved to tell people what my experience was and, and what a unique group of people I ran into and animals. Um, this was around the time of Gunther Gable Williams. This guy is, is credited uh, with revolutionizing kind of the style of animal training. Prior to that, it was very much whip and chair, you know, man's dominance over beast. But this guy was one of the first people to really present the human-animal bond. He was very, very into presenting and featuring the animal. Now, don't get me wrong, he was a phenomenal performer in his own right, but the main thing he wanted to promote was the animal. Um, interestingly, tomorrow, November 12th, marks the 45th anniversary of the Feld family taking over, buying Ringling Brothers Barnum and & Bailey. And as of tomorrow, they will have owned this show for 45 years, which is longer than the Ringling Brothers. And an also historical celebration is that the three Feld daughters, third generation, are now involved in this company. It's a privately owned company. The Feld family owns it. So it's truly a, a, um, an affair of the heart to these folks. They're phenomenal business people. but They also genuinely care about and promote the animal aspect of, of our performances. They're very, very, very involved in fighting the activist agenda. They have to be. If they didn't choose to be, they could simply do what the activists ask us to do, which is take the animals out of the circus. To our way of thinking and to the Feld family's way of thinking, it would no longer be a circus, right? But that's what we think. Um, Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey is one year older than professional baseball in America. So it is very much the story of America. And Gunther Gable Williams, although he's a German guy, he was a German import, import Irvin Feld traveled to Germany like this guy so much that he actually bought the entire circus that Gunther was in and brought them over to brought Gunther and his family over to the United States. At that point, the show split into two shows, a blue unit, a red unit. So this way, each unit visits 45 cities a year, um, and every year a city gets a brand new show. We also have a third unit that's a one-ring show that plays smaller venues. 
So this is the kind of stuff that I fell into, right? How do you look at something like that every day and not be awed? I don't know. I, I was. And I, again, I was so impressed by what I saw, what it took for people to work with animals in this kind of way. Now, you have to admit, you can, this woman cannot, none of us, the strongest man in the world cannot overpower any of these animals. The whole notion of it being an idea of force or dominance is ridiculous. It's mutual respect, mutual dependency. We need each other. It's cooperation. And it also, to me, gives these animals such purpose. And if I believe if we take them from the wild, most of our animals now are captive bred, um, we have to give them something to do. We have to give them an alternative use for their intelligence. And working with us, again, it's a mutual respect situation. It's a really phenomenal thing. Um, this woman, unfortunately, both these, uh, the animal and the, the woman have passed, as has Gunther Gable Williams. But to watch this relationship among people, I had to have it. I just had to have it. So my family, Ulta, there's a whole long story. I was very, very long-winded about this the last time I presented. I'm going to try to clip it, right? But my family went on to have a bear act phenomenal uh, experience. We learned so much from the bears. Um, we also at one point had a, one of our Eurasian brown pair bears rode an African elephant. Um, this was back when Ringling had both Asian and African elephants. When the African elephants that they had in their possession passed on, the Feld family decided to dedicate themselves entirely to the Asian elephant. The Asian elephant is highly endangered. There are only about 35,000 left in the world, and they're not doing well in their range countries. The human elephant conflict is horrendous, and it continues to be so because the populations continue to grow, and there's simply no rangeland for these animals. And I was so gratified today to hear many people allude to the fact that nature is hostile, nature is tough. So that's another thing that we fight, you know, this whole concept of set them free, set them free. It's just not as simple as that. It's not possible. And in fact, I firmly believe I'm obviously biased, but I'm biased by experience, that these animals do so much better in a managed care situation, and that, that involves humans. Uh, my family also went on to, have, again, another long story, but I got a golden retriever as a gift, and um, we did a hobby breeding site situation one time. We couldn't part with any of the puppies. You know, is it, they couldn't do it. So, circus people, what are you going to do? We, we put them in an act. I ask you to look at those beautiful dogs. Do not look at that thing on that girl's head. I have no idea what she was thinking. But they were, they were lovely dogs. I don't know, um, well, you can kind of see this. This represents an era, uh, they call it the golden age of the circus. When the circus came to town, because we had no radio, TV, internet, none of that stuff, they had a huge circus parade, and some of you probably remember hearing about it. You may not have attended one, but it was an ama amazing event. Banks closed, schools closed, and it's actually from this experience that the expression hold your horses evolved because people genu generally rode their horses or, or they were in carriages pulled by horses to get to the event, and when the elephants came through and the camels and all the other exotic animals that people had never seen, the horses would bolt. So someone would go ahead of the parade traditionally and say, hold your horses, kind of cool. A bunch of American uh, colloquialisms have come from Ringling Brothers Barn and Bailey Circus and the smaller circuses. Um, we still do an animal walk, but now we travel by train. Most of you probably know that. It's the largest privately owned train in the world, and the animal cars are all pri um, custom designed. They ride right behind the engine. The performers, who are way less important, ride near the back. Um, I, I did that, and it was fine, but the animals do get priority, uh, priority towing in this event. And the trains park in each town as close as they can to the building, and then we unload the animals and they are walked to the building. The difference now in, in this uh, picture in this era from the one that I showed you before is it's a very paranoid situation now. Instead of going through the town with all this fanfare, we're looking over our shoulder because I go to these animal walks as much as I can now. I visit both of our large units very frequently, and it has become a frightening situation. There are lots of people there. We have a huge fan base, and that's never going to go away. We have from little children to grandparents who love the circus and, and always will. But we also, this opportunity um, is exploited by activists, and what they typically do is harass our handlers, throw things at the elephants. They try to upset, upset the elephants because the ultimate goal for them is to catch that little snapshot on video of our handlers correcting the elephants, which they're, they're doing professionally, but taken out of context, it can be used, can and is used against us. So in LA, we walk the animals at like two in the morning. 
um, Madison Square Garden. We walk the elephants. Now, some of this is traffic related too because we're not going to glom up city streets. But a lot of it has to do with it is we are totally concerned with the safety of the animals. And there are people who are out there who are not. So we have to watch, you know, we have to be very, very vigilant about that. This is kind of hard to see. But I took this shot myself in 72 when I first joined the circus. And if you can make out along the front of the elephant's feet, there's a row of chain. It's, it was called, is called a picket line. It was very efficient. I hung out in the elephant tent as much as they would tolerate me. We still, to this day, we don't let people hang out a lot because it's a place of business. There is always something going on involving the animals. And, and frankly, um, people who aren't involved in that get in the way. Um, but what I noticed was very peaceful, um, contented elephants. And this was part of a management system that has been updated. But I'll have to tell you from having been around this a lot, I love that. I love that. The elephants could interact. They couldn't fight. They couldn't steal each other's food. They got a lot of exercise. You have to exercise them. Their well-being and the quality of their lives has to be absolutely prioritized because can you imagine with any of these animals working with a pissed off elephant pissed off bear no you know why do that when you can do it a better way but currently this is how our animals are housed now sometimes we're indoor housing but this happens to be Tampa Florida and we have electric strands cattle wire you know low tensor cattle wire spread out and we delineate yard areas we put them in compatible groups because they are a herd animal and they will fight but we bring in loads of dirt loads of sand they love to throw sand on themselves we provide tires logs things that they like to play with and they get to go in the tent stay out of the tent it's just it's really cool it's really different than before and if you can see in the back of the tent there's a row of boards that they're allowed to get up off the concrete. I find it so interesting. There's a lot of work to unload this in every town, assemble the boards, and take it down at the end of the run. And more often than not, the elephants stay off the boards. You know, they have the choice, but they stay off the boards. They're also very, very interested in people. We have an animal open house in towns that have the space to allow it. And the public, in this, in this town we did have that, the public can go right up to the fence there, the public that, with a ticket, and they can watch the elephants interact. And the elephants watch the people interact. I always wonder it, you know, who, who's finding it more interesting. Another improvement that I'm very proud about, because this is where I basically live, this is my home base, is the Ringling Brothers Center for Elephant Conservation in Central Florida. This was founded in 1995. It's 200 acres. And this is where our Asian elephants retire, reproduce, and where a great deal of research is done. Now, if it were not for the fact that we can handle these elephants, you know, right up close, um, they would not get the veterinary care, the husbandry care, and the research. Our elephants are included in over 70 published papers, and that's really something. That's amazing. This is a hugely challenged species. And to think that, um, there are a group of them out on the traveling units so that people all over the United States can go and see how amazing they are, and at the same time, there's a group here at the Center for Elephant Conservation, we call it the CEC, who are also offering a great deal to their species. And by the way, we're very proud of our breeding program. We've had 24 births. That's really huge. Again, for, yeah. I'm going to pass all this on to Mr. Feld and the Feld family. They need to hear that, your, your awareness of, of what I'm telling you. Um, but only about a third of our elephants actually perform. It's so amazing to have the latitude here because of this facility to only use those elephants who actually show an inclination, who show the personality, kind of like you guys do with dogs. It's, it's really a luxury that we didn't have, again, when I started. Another really cool thing that we do, and this is a, a main part of my job, is um, training interns, training young people. Twice a year, we bring a group of six in. They stay with us for 10 weeks. It's a paid internship. Actually, I want to get away from the word internship because it's kind of stigmatized. It's, it's mainly a, 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 an elephant care training program. And they live with us on this working farm for 10 weeks. They immediately go to work with the elephants. Uh, they live in a campground. We try to get them very used to living in small quarters because a lot of people cannot tolerate that. And that's a real part of our lifestyle. You have to be able to tolerate people that you can't stand. And you have to work with them every day. And sometimes you go back to the train car, and guess what? They're your neighbor. 
you're sharing the shower, not at the same time. Or I don't know if they do. I don't want to know about it. But it's a, <laughs> but it, it's a difficult adjustment for some people. And frankly, the class that we just finished last week, we had six. This time, all women. First time we've had all women. And of the six, five chose to go to work with us on the traveling units. Um, we take this group out, typically, to one of our traveling units. We cram them all in a van. We travel to one venue so that they participate in teardown. Then we travel to the next facility, they participate in setup, and then we come back home. And again, it's a means of getting them used to, or at least exposed to the lifestyle to see if this is what they really want to do. Um, they learn every aspect of elephant care, loading the hay, um, examining the hay, looking at the elephants every day. Um, it's a lot of grunt work. It's just not a glamorous job at all. An elephant act goes on for about seven minutes, right? The rest of the time, and believe me, it's your life, it's not your job, the rest of the time is very dirty, dirty work. If you don't love the animals, it's not for you. This was a very interesting group of interns. We brought uh, four interns over from Sri Lanka. I was really lucky to go over there and select these folks. They came over to our facility. They stayed with us for a year. These guys lived in, Sur in Sri Lanka, which is a country the size of West Virginia second most densely populated country in the world, and they have a, a healthy indigenous population of elephants. However, none of these guys had ever touched an elephant before. And unfortunately, last year in Sri Lanka, almost 200 elephants were shot. Now check it out, this is an endangered species, but there's not room for this huge population explosion and the elephants in one small country. So another improvement that our company is funding is trying to instruct Sri Lankan people, how to take care of their elephants in captivity rather than shooting them. We're not saying that they should all be in captivity, but when a, a situation arises that a, an elephant is you know, going into farmlands, um, we want them to be able to take care of them as we are in a, in a, you know, a, a managed situation. We've also found out recently, um, having funded the first census ever in Sri Lanka of numbers, sex, gender, so on and so forth, birth, hopefully, you know, counting the calves that are there to see how they're doing as far as breeding. Um, we did find out that some of the people living along the preserves, because they do, the elephants only live in game preserves, um, are actually baiting the elephants, feeding the elephants to come to the borders so for tourism, for ecotourism. And the heartbreak of this is it's only a short time before the elephants go through the fence and then you know, it, it doesn't always have a happy ending. So we're really hoping that the training that these guys uh, received from us and in finishing their master's degree, it's, it's in, intended to benefit the Asian elephant in situ. So we really hope that that's, and we're seeing it happen, but it's a slow process and a very expensive process. So we've also set up an affiliation with um, the university in Rajarata, the um, Ringling Brothers Center for the study of the Asian elephant. So we have two buildings there, a, an office and a dorm and a, uh, with a little kitchen, because we want to encourage other people to come and study range country uh, activities of Asian elephants. Again, you know, this is all going on behind the costumes and the glitter and the music and the stuff that you see when you go to the, the circus. And a bit of every, a, a, a faction of every ticket price goes to support these kind of programs. It's really, it's really incredible. Far, a lot more depth uh, to the circus than a lot of people would imagine. Oh my goodness, and then there's Dr. Wendy Kiso, who is here back at that table with my buddies. Um, she is our... <laughs> She is our resident research scientist, and how cool is this? Um, we're very proud of our 24 births. Um, 23 of them were natural births, but we have a logistical problem. Most of our breeding age females are on our traveling shows. We have the largest sustainable herd of, of Asian elephants in the Western Hemisphere. We have the largest herd of males who are very difficult to keep. They each have to have their own um, barn and yard because they don't play well with others. Um, so we have to figure out a way to perfect artificial insemination. Now, I know this is just a matter of course in cattle, horses, and it's even successful um, in African elephants, but it's very, very difficult with Asian elephants. And Dr. Kiso's main agenda is to conquer cryopreservation, to be able to, be able to freeze and then reconstitute the semen 
when it gets to wherever there is a, a cycling female. And I have to say that we share this semen. Not only, it's not only for our company, it's with other zoos who are cycling. Again, the agenda is a very dwindling population of Asian elephants. So I think we can safely say that Dr. C, uh, Dr. Kiso is, puts the semen in circus. Again, it's kind of a, a, a dichotomy. <laughs> oh, she's going to kill me for that later. <laughs> but it, the bottom picture shows part of her lab. Her lab is phenomenal. It's in our training center, and I watch all these amazing pieces of equipment come through that door. I have no idea what they are. I have no idea, and Wendy explains to us what each of these things are. But it's really a state-of-the-art lab, and nobody else is doing this. First of all, it's, it's prohibitively expensive, but also to focus this kind of talent on an agenda that is, is going to benefit the Asian elephant. It is not necessarily going to populate our traveling shows with elephants. It's a really a very altruistic and, and essential undertaking. Um, this is Barack. He was born, it'll be uh, four years ago in January, the night before the inauguration, hence the name. He is our first and so far only successful AI birth. An amazing elephant. Um, this, that's also Dr. Graham, our director of veterinary care. We currently have five five veterinarians that travel with our shows, and we have a, a vet tech that, tra that stays on each show. So the, the level of talent scientific talent that Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey supports is really phenomenal. And these guys have also shared their knowledge, continue to share their knowledge with other facilities because again, we're one community trying to save the Asian elephant. That's Barack's brief uh, career in show business. Male elephants in the wild um, are run off from the matriarchal herd when they reach puberty. And we have to emulate that with our practices of, of managed care. Not all of our males, not all of our elephants, as I said, ultimately perform, but every once in a while we have a real talent like we did with Barack. He thrived on it. He loves the attention. He's with his mom. So he didn't do much in the show. He just kind of walked around. But it was such a stimulating situation for he and his mom. I mean, you know, thousands of people in these arenas. It was really, really cool. I was so glad that he got to do that. When he, he has nice big old tusks now, only the male Asians have tusks. They don't all, but um, he does. He has a nice set of tusks. And when he started to figure out he was a boy, and I mean not just with you know, signs of aggression, but there started to be that two trunk appearance thing, which is just not meant for family. Got it? Okay, I know. Come on, guys. Stay with me here. I know it's late in the day. <laughs> Time to bring him home. And that's where he is now. Now, hopefully, he will ultimately become part of our breeding program. No guarantee but the opportunity will be there for him to just kind of segue into that. Another study that's been done there, uh, and that we're still working on this, it's body condition scoring. So these are scientists from the Fort Worth Zoo who come through every once in a while, and again, they can get right up close like that. This elephant doesn't know them from, you know, could be you, could be me, because <laughs> I'm not a handler, so for me to get up next to an elephant makes my heart race. It's, it's still a thrill. But this is another study with which we're involved, and it's very important because we're, again, trying to discern what body type best suits reproduction, as well as just the general health. You know, these are huge animals, the largest land mammal. So we have arthritic issues, we have foot issues, and with our elephants, we are able to um, perpetuate a lot of science that you could not do if you couldn't handle these elephants. If you couldn't handle these elephants, they weren't trained. So, I love this. Uh, this, I have to remind myself of this because I told you when I first started out I would just be talking to press in every town we played and bragging about what a cool experience it was to be in the circus. But now, unfortunately, the tide has changed and this is where that misinformation thing comes in. And I love Rudyard Kipling for this poem. If you haven't read If, you need to, to check it out. Again, I'm sure you've heard it in school. This is the one that starts out, if you can keep your head when those about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, right? You've heard that. So how about this line? And we deal frequently with knaves and fools. So I'd like to believe that a lot of these animal activists genuinely, I said like to believe, genuinely care about animals. But these are the knaves. And what is really, really horrible to witness, and you guys are well aware of this, is the fools who believe this. Um, go on YouTube and, and punch in deer crossing and hear a radio show, and may, maybe you've heard this, I, it's, uh, right? You know what I'm talking about? Where a woman calls into the radio show, she's very articulate, and she's impassioned. Why are you putting those deer crossing signs on the busy highways? Why don't you put it in an area where they can safely cross the street? <laughs> and you can't get her off the topic. I mean, she really, really believes that. Frightening. Fools. So, 
here is kind of the basis of, I believe, why Ringling Brothers is so lambasted. Not only do we draw huge crowds, we, we, um, we visit or are seen by approximately 10 million people a year. That's a lot of people. So where are the activists going to go to get the most bang for their buck? We're, we're perfect, right? We're perfect. And I've seen it escalate every year. Um, this picture was just taken in L.A. last year. And I, I think you can see the signs. It's kind of dark. But I stood there this year watching the people come in, and the activists were turning like this and whacking people in the heads with the signs. I mean, people, our guests, coming in to see the show. So I went to security, and I pointed out to security what was going on, and, and the building security said, hey, we can't do anything about it, you know, First Amendment rights. So what are you going to do? Free speech. Um, this, was all, this was last year. Um, again, look at the signs. I was standing right at the back of the line of people that were buying tickets. So this is how close these folks get. They're loud. They're profane. We're a family show. Feld Entertainment is the largest producer of family entertainment in the world. We also produce uh, Disney on Ice and uh, motors, Motorsports, Monster Jam, Nuclear Cowboys. Our audience is kids. Kids of all ages, sure, but a lot of kids. It is horrific to me to see the language that these people use against us, and it's escalated every year. They're off their leashes. They really are. Whoops. Hey. Well, it doesn't like that slide. I really want you to see that slide. Okay, hold on a second. Bear with me here. Because it's my cue points, you see. If I take that slide out of there, I'm just going to have to fold up and leave. <laughs> Which I will. I will. Don't get impatient. Um, one of the main contentions with the activists with us is the guide, formerly known as the bullhook. These guys are so, so strategic. Since they cannot affect our fan base, and by the way, Ringling Brothers is doing better business every year. Unfortunately, that means more people. But hey, thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, that means more people that they can target, right? Okay, so I think you guys may have heard about the HSUS lawsuit. It went on for almost 10 years, and guess what? We won. I don't want to wear out your hands. <laughs> Hallelujah. A six and a half week trial that involved all our people. And you have to figure our, the peop, our people who were called to be deposed and who had to fly to DC to participate in this trial are animal trainers, animal handlers. That means that they're probably sociophobic, usually. We choose animals as a lifestyle because a lot of us just don't really do well with people. It was horribly disruptive for them to have to spend that long in a court of law, right? So, um, it was found at the end of the six and a half week ordeal that actually went on for 10 years, millions of dollars, millions of dollars. Uh, they were found to have no standing, no standing because they had a paid plaintiff. So the real good news is that now we're going after them with the RICO Act. The racketeer, yeah. That's the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act that, was, that came to be in 1970, pr primarily to go after um, the mobs, right? I mean, that's what got John Gotti, the Teflon. Uh, I wish I could remember all the beautiful Italian names that were involved in that, because they, like, they're just lyrical. But that, you know, the RICO Act is a really important thing. And just recently, uh, the activists uh, filed a motion to dismiss. That was denied. So we're moving ahead with real enthusiasm, and I am so grateful to the Feld family for sticking with this, because again, they could just say, uh, Disney on Ice, Monster Jam, Nuclear Cowboys, Bye Bye Ringling Brothers, but they're not going to do it. It is their family legacy, and they are sticking with it, and it's really, it's really phenomenal. Okay, so. <laughs> so enhanced videos, and you guys have these too. Uh, it's become commonplace to us. now. Truly, some of the stuff that we see on the videos is sloppy handling. We take this very, very seriously. Um, I'm not dismissing that. We address it every single time. Are any of the animals mistreated? No, absolutely not. We would not tolerate that. We will never tolerate that. But I will never believe any video that I see having to do with anything after what I've seen they do with us. Sound enhancement, distortion of actual quotes. It's incredible. I didn't know you could do that. Hey, I can barely operate this computer, so I, I had no idea that you could do stuff like that. This proposed bullhook ban is absolutely disgusting. 
uh, you've got to admire their tactics. You have to admire, admire their stick to right? They can't ban the elephants, traveling elephants, even though there is a bill proposed right now in the House of Representatives. We'll address that later. Um, so now what they've tried to do is ban the essential tools that we use to work these elephants. And that would be the guide. And as you can see, in that picture. It's, a, it's really a very innocuous stick, and as you're looking at the pictures of the elephants, you'll notice that everybody's carrying a stick. It's about yay long. It fits in the palm of your hand, so, you know, I don't know, it's not maybe a half inch to an inch circumference. Pardon me. It has a hook at the end and a point at the end. It's stainless steel. It's very clean, right? You have to have a tactile backup to the verbal commands that these elephants are trained with. You have to have a come here backup. You have to have a get over backup. You have a bridle, reins, spurs with a horse. Uh, you have a leash, collar with a dog. We have to has, have something. We contend um, that it's the professional use of this tool that is hugely important. You are, you are not going to abuse an animal that is not only your livelihood, that is not only hugely emotionally important to you and you have built this amazing bond with, but each one of these animals costs about $65,000 a year to take care of. And by the way, that's the ones at the CEC as well, not just our performing elephants. But you have to have this tool. So now, consistently, they drag my old butt around the country and a number of others of us to uh, testify in favor of the use of this tool. Chicago, Atlanta, Boston, Minneapolis, and it's growing. We are highly regulated, just like the egg industry. We're, we have to have a USDA permit in order to travel. We have to have a state permit to even pass through a state. And we have to have a municipal permit to show in a particular town. So we're regulated and inspected, unannounced inspections, by these three entities, right? So naturally, we are going to comply with the guidelines that these folks have in place. Um, I find it really almost humorous, except that it's kind of sickening in a way. We have taken these guides with us to these different testimonies. We go right through security. Inevitably, <laughs> I know, it's so funny because the other side shows up with this fireplace poker that they brandish in front of this unsuspecting group of fools, and they have a cop walk up with them. And they say, we had to have law enforcement come with us because this is a weapon. And we take ours out and go, oh, really, here's ours. We got right through security. And by the way, this is the one we really use. But they're undaunted. They bring school kids in to sit on the floor to witness um, you know, a civil hearing, it's amazing. It, it is really frightening. And I, I want you guys to know this because it's very self-serving. I want you to um, support the circus even if you don't like the circus because they're going after you guys too. Um, we might be keeping them at bay for a while, but it, it's, you know, it's only temporary. But it's, it's absolutely slanderous. And it, it, as I say, it's escalating. That I find so shocking. Last year, I don't know if any of you guys saw the movie Water for Elephants, and Carrie Johnson is with us here today. She and her husband founded and own Have Trunk Will Travel. They own Ty, who is that magnificent elephant in that movie. Um, one of the people in Atlanta last year on the terrorist side testified that all you have to do to see that we beat our elephants is watch Water for Elephants. So again, fools, fools. On the microphone, this woman said that. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Carrie um, in the end. Slanderous editorials. Okay, this was Salt Lake City two weeks ago. And I have to answer these. That's another part of my job. I do have the best job in the world, Ken, but sometimes it's, there's just so much bullshit involved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this was two weeks ago. At Ringling's Training Center, baby elephants are ripped away from their mothers and have their spirits broken. They're tied down with rope, shot with electric prods, and gouged with bull hooks, a weapon that resembles a fireplace poker. Since 2000, Ringling has been cited and fined for serious violations of federal animal welfare laws, including failing to provide veterinary care and causing physical harm and discomfort to elephants. Just last year, Ringling paid the largest fine in circus history, $270,000 for violating the Federal Animal Welfare Act. Ringling is only able to stay afloat because its ticket sales revenues outpaces the fines it must pay for violating the law. This perverse and unethical business model ensures that animals will continue to be abused so long as people, many well-meaning animal lovers who don't know what happens behind the scenes, continue to buy tickets. So just for a second, I want to clarify that. First of all, this is completely ridiculous. Yes, we did reach a settlement with the USDA. Um, we always cooperate with the USDA. First of all, we have to. Second of all, it's just ethical, and we do that. Um, over a period of five years, 
um, are at that time five facilities, three of our traveling units, the Center for Elephant Conservation and a, a retirement facility that we formerly had in northern Florida. Five facilities over five years. We incurred 23 citations. We have never been in violation of the Animal Welfare Act, never. And there is a huge, huge difference. I'm sure you would agree with me, Dr. Carter Coker, between a, a citation and a violation. We work very hard to keep it that way. Do we have housekeeping issues? You betcha. Do we clean them up? You betcha. But we, we admit wrongdoing. So rather than be drugged back into court, because we just finished a 10-year ordeal, we're going back into another one, the Feld family decided to pay a penalty different than a fine. I know this is semantics, but look how our words are twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. This, is just, this comes out in every town. And another thing that is amazing to me, it's such canned rhetoric. They just go to the dial up a complaint thing and, you know, copy and paste. And then I have to come up with, because I try, I try to answer them genuinely, because I really believe in this. And I don't want to give them back what they're giving me, which is just a prepackaged, you know, rhetoric that, that has no basis in reality. Okay, so harassment of guests. I just showed you that. They are now getting whacked in the head with the signs. And the good thing about this is people are getting aggravated. Are they moving to action? That I really don't know. But they are getting very aggravated because this is ridiculous. They're going to a great, great show, and they're having to pass through this gauntlet of abuse with little children. It's, it's completely ridiculous. Um, threat to the circus employees. Our animal people live on the lot with the animals. So constantly, there are video cameras taped to sticks that are held up along our perimeter fencing. Their every move is videoed. It's very, very, very um, threatening. And it, it gets, you know, very simply, it gets on your nerves. You're living your life. It's a 24-hour you know, involvement. Horrible. Um, also, the, the, the personal threats. I get hate mail. I'm on Facebook, but I never go on Facebook. I will not submit anything to Facebook because I open up my email every once in a while and there's, there are death threats. It's really hideous. It's why? I'm a clown for crying out loud. You know, I don't know. It makes no sense. This year on the animal walk in LA, I was in the vet tech van right behind the elephants. Our dancers and clowns hold ropes walking along the street to keep dogs back, to kind of alert the animal handlers as to what's going on. This is the first time I saw this line crossed and I cannot believe it. The activists attacked our people, and these are dancers and clowns. I saw one guy, who we know very well, he's become kind of a celebrity, take the tripod of his camera and whack a clown three times with it. Another showgirl that was at the end of the line was totally surrounded and pummeled. Our, our director of circus operations is six foot three, and another one of the activists wound up and punched him in the back. It was all on film. I was very disappointed in the outcome of us taking them to court. They put a restraining order on two of the activists and that was kind of it. So these are the kind of biases that we deal with on a regular basis. We had video proof, there it was, and we still did not get, you know, I, I wasn't satisfied with that. Again, that's, that's just my opinion. What state was that? Uh, it was Los Angeles. It was this summer. From current slide, here we go. Okay, hold on just a second. I'm going to get through this, okay? And then I promise you I will answer everything and everybody wants to go, I'll, I'll talk to you privately. So here is another thing that, we're, that we do. Again, part of our change is we're a very private group because we're always working, very few breaks. But we now make it a practice of inviting the public in. This is on, a tra on one of the traveling shows. Um, that's one of the outside housing tents that our elephants stay in, our, our exotics stay in, in similar tents. But we invite primarily kids in. I agree with what uh, Dr. Grandin said, that you have to appeal to the young kids. They have to know what we're doing and we have to be transparent. And believe me, it's been a cultural adjustment for us. So we appeal to a lot of young kids and we also have to appeal to a lot of older people. Oh wait, that's me. <laughs> and, and also, um, this is Piper our calf that was born in August. And I don't want to give the impression that we sit around and hug elephants all day. I would love to. But again, that's not treating elephants like elephants. So every once in a while, the handlers let us sneak in and kind of, you know, pop a shot like that. It's, um, it's really, and I have to tell you, I've been there for nine births and it is a totally life altering experience to see an elephant born after a 22 month gestation period, right? Um, and they have a smell that's as unique as a puppy smell. You know how every puppy has a puppy smell? Baby elephants have a baby elephant smell. And I, I know I, I'm kind of flaunting my good luck here to tell you that I know what it is. It's great. It's really, 
It's really great. We also um, we hold elephant brunches in each town that we play. And this is just their regular diet, but we dress it up. We put it on long tables, and we invite the public to come in. They don't have to come to the show, but they all bring their kids. We advertise this. We want the kids, we want the people to see how elephants eat, and it's really cool. They steal each other's food. They lean on each other. It's a really cool event, and we hold those all over the country. Ah. Oh, okay. Hey, that didn't work before, and now it does. We also hold continuing education classes on our traveling units. This is one of our veterinarians um, teaching a particular course. We have a, a six-phase curriculum that we repeat each year, and we hold the classes right in the animal tents and barns. We bring sandwiches and food, and it's really, really fun. And we're trying to impress upon our animal care people that this is a profession and not a job. And continuing education is something that does typify a profession. So that's another really cool thing that we didn't have back in the day. Oh, there's another um, elephant brunch, as you can see, in, in the very cold. That happens, the upper right happens to be Tampa, Florida. So I'm winding up now. But these are just some of the amazing, amazing things that I get to see every day. And it is a privilege. But it's a privilege that we are having to fight harder for each year. These people want us out of business. And I have to tell you that my friend Carrie Johnson, um, having th these people are phenomenal. They're based in California. When you see an elephant in a commercial or a movie, it's pretty likely one of the Johnson's elephants. They are regarded without argument in our industry as the peak of the industry. I am not only thrilled to know Carrie as a, as a colleague, but I'm absolutely blessed to have her as a dear friend. <laughs> Many, many people in the elephant business want to work for the Johnsons, have trunk will travel. Very few can because their standards are not only extremely high, but they're fiercely defended. So you really have to have some chops to work for those folks. And their reputation precedes them everywhere they go. Two people that bought a ticket to go see Water for Elephants sued them last year because they said that after they saw, now they were backed by ADI, Animal Defenders International. Is that right, Carrie? Okay. These two guys with, you know, uh, lucrative backing sued them for fraud because they went home and watched the videos and it, they said that they were defrauded into thinking that these people took good care of their elephants. And then th the Johnsons also do a state-of-the-art elephant ride in, in you know, a lot of places. It's not just an elephant ride, not just the experience of, a, of your lifetime to go ride one of their amazing elephants, but they, they offer an entire educational setup. It's amazing. Um, and that's their bread and butter. They do weddings, movies, commercials. Have you seen this Fariva commercial where the elephant's following the guy with, that's, that's their elephant. So I, I'm so proud of this, my gosh. Um, but these people were at the ride handing out leaflets, telling people that if you ever rode one of the Johnson's elephants or saw water for elephants, you could become part of a class action suit against them. <laughs> Okay, the suit was thrown out, but these are folks who work 24-7 taking care of their six elephants, and they spent an ungodly sum of money just to have the right to continue to be the excellent people that they are. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, okay. <laughs> this is an example of us ripping the babies away from the mothers. I guarantee you that that mother is saying, rip, rip. <laughs> but and in fact, our, our calves stay with the mothers until they basically let us know it's time for weaning, and it's different for, um, for every, every decision we make involving these animals is done individually. That's another luxury that we have. Um, I know I'm leaving out tons of stuff, but I want you guys to remember this, because this is really, really true. And if they knock us out, first of all, I don't know what they're thinking, because if they knock us out, then who are they going to hit on? Hmm, could be you guys. And I know they are already. They are already. But it's only going to get worse because we provide them with such an amazing arena, literally, to display themselves. And they are hanging themselves. I was amazed in L.A. this summer. I usually stand there and do five or six interviews in a day. I didn't do one. You know why? It's not a story anymore. I think the press is getting tired of it. That doesn't mean that the slander is going to stop. I mean, it's like whack-a-mole. You know that arcade game where you whack the mole down and three more pop up? That's what it is, dealing with these guys. But there's so much at stake. There is so much at stake, and you guys are all in this together, and that with us, and that's what's so amazing about this group, and I'm so grateful to Patty and Rod and Ken Strand, too, for putting this group together. What an amazing sacrifice, and what an amazing chance for us to all hear the stew pot that we're in. 
because it's true, if we don't stand together, we are going to fall separately. Um, I know I've left stuff out, <laughs> but I have amazing colleagues back there. I have Julie McWright from um, our legal department, of course, Dr. Kiso, our semen queen, <laughs> Carrie Johnson, and actually the last uh, surviving bear cub of the ARIA performing bears, my daughter, is there. So have I left anything out, you guys, that you would like me to mention? Don't be shy. Because once I open it up to these guys, I may never come home again. <laughs> no? Nope.